that has changed. Anyway, welcome you all to the first talk of the second round of speakers on critical perspectives on technology. Um, for those of you who don't know yet, this lecture series is part of my research project on exceptional norms, marginalized bodies in interaction design, and this semester also of the class on critical theory on media and informatics. My name is Katha Spiel, and I'm a Hertha Fernberg postdoctoral scholar at TU Wien, where I research uh, on marginalized perspectives on technology to inform critical design and engineering. For your access needs, uh, I'm going to post a link to the slides right now, and I'm gonna keep on, I will reiterate on posting them when more people show up. And I will also upload um, a version of the script in the chat. There you go. But you're also not uh, here to hear from me so much, you're here to hear from Sabine. Sabine Hara works as a faculty member at the Department of Game Design at Uppsala University in Sweden. And in their artistic and teaching practice, as well as in their writing, they use video games as a thing to reframe, challenge, and queer norms around desire and intimacy. Their presentation for today is titled Performing Whiteness in Play. So you can ask questions during and after the presentation in the chat window, or however Sabina tells you. And afterwards, we will be, uh, we will hopefully all be in discussion, but this discussion is being led by Kay Kender, who is a pre-doc researcher also at TUV and currently uses design education and participatory design with students as an exploration of values in the creation and use of social media for well-being. But for now, Savina, take it away. Thank you, Kata. And I'm absolutely fine with everyone um, asking questions during my presentation um, or posting comments um, if you are OK with um, the condition of this being recorded. So um, can you see my slides, the ones without the presenter's notes? Yes, wonderful. Yes. So. Um, there's a lot of uh, ground to cover here. Um, this talk is uh, addressing whiteness in games and, and therefore deals with white supremacy and racism. This is a content notice. There are going, uh, there are going to be some upsetting images, um, especially in the first game example that I'm gonna uh, be discussing because this topic is addressing European colonialist atrocities. Um, but let me start by addressing as clearly as I can some ambitions and limitations of this talk and set some expectations. Uh, first on the notion of whiteness. What is whiteness? Uh, whiteness, um, more than simply an ethnic identity, has been described, um, for instance, by Audre Lorde as part of a mythical norm which structures privilege and dignity in specific ways. And the normative power of whiteness has been discussed in terms of its invisible properties of not being seen. But this has also been criticized as blatantly untrue for those who do see the white norms and have to work around it all day, those who aren't white. Um, and those uh, who are white, like myself and many others here, um, not seeing it is kind of rooted in a choice, in a privilege, not necessarily in inability. So what does it mean then um, if I want to try and see whiteness as a white Austrian media scholar like my, myself? Um, there is an obvious paradox here, an important limitation which needs to be addressed. Uh, the paradox is that by trying to see whiteness while being white, not only will I see an incomplete flawed picture painted through the lens of my own privilege and socialization, but I will also inevitably, inevitably recenter and confirm whiteness as a norm. Um, this latter, this, this paradox is an awkward place for whiteness studies more, more generally. So critical whiteness studies is invested in the dismantling of whiteness, but it can only do so through declarations, through self-reflection. And in her article, um, Declarations of Whiteness, the Non-Performativity of Anti-Racism, Sarah Ahmed discusses the myth of transcendence in whiteness studies. So 
by saying that we are we are racist because we have been socialized as white and we're so self-reflective about that um and we we admitting that we are bad so to speak we automatically become good ahmed criticizes this self-reflexive turn in whiteness studies as a fantasy because as she says the conditions are simply not in place that would allow such declarations to do what they say under the current conditions where whiteness is the norm any declarations of anti-racism prevent rather than facilitate anti-racist transformation for myself this means that i cannot claim in this talk that i am anti-racist in that i cannot claim this talk to transcend whiteness since i'm white myself it will as i said already recenter it to some extent and it will do so from my own partial perspective as a white person seeing whiteness however i will as richard dyer recommends attempt to look at whiteness with the ambition to make it strange not in order to declare my detachment from it but to understand how this attachment works but who am i to do this to position myself i use um biographical technique, which I learned from my dear friend, um, scholar and activist, Leonardo Custocho. Um, I was born as the first of four children to two white Austrian parents in 1984. This means I was born 209 years after William Boltz made a proposal to the Austrian-Hungarian Empress Maria Theresia to establish trade with India and Africa. This proposal was approved. I was born 188 years after the body of Angela Soliman, a black member of the Viennese court, was stuffed and exhibited at the Museum of Natural History in Vienna. I was born 112 years after the Austrian expedition ship Tegethoff arrived at the Arctic Circle, and while drifting on ice, crew members spotted an archipelago, which they named after the Emperor Franz Josef. I was born 99 years after Austria-Hungary participated in the Berlin Conference on African colonization. I was never taught about this in school. I was born 44 years after my great grand aunt joined the League of German Girls, um, the female branch of Hitler Youth, Bund Deutsche Mädchen. There she was taught how best to avoid racial defilement, the relationships between Aryans and non-Aryans. I was born nine years after many Turkish guest workers who had helped rebuild Austrian economy uh, during the 50s after the war were driven out of the country via the Aliens Employment Act. I was born 11 years before PlayStation 1 and 13 years before Nintendo 64 console came out in Austria. So when I look at games, this is the kind of baggage that I bring with me as someone raised in Europe, uh, as someone steeped in privileges and uh, in my ancestors' complicity with race-based atrocities. So how, how to look at games from that vantage point? This talk will address has four parts. First, um, a little bit on how game studies has addressed whiteness. Secondly, I'll move to the first example, which is the board game, The Star of Africa from 51. Then I look at the second example, Ascension Dawn of Champions, which came out in 2015. And I'll close with some conclusive thoughts on where this all might take us. So let's jump into game studies and its relationship to whiteness or how game studies has studied whiteness. Um, and this is just like an overview of some concepts because I, I won't review the whole field uh, here. So one of the ways in which video games uh, and simulations maintain whiteness or have said to maintain whiteness as a norm is obviously through the representation of white characters as default avatars and default gaming heroes. David Leonard, for instance, has argued that video games can be regarded as racial projects whose um, products, processes, and practices 
um, maintain a certain hegemonic racial order. So when you look at this image, this is the default character in Fallout 4, um, right before we can modify the character and create our own. Um, the player can switch between these two white characters and then modify each of them. The subtle suggestion here is who comes first and is therefore the most playable. And this kind of defines this racial order. It's just one of the examples. Another thing that has been discussed um, is the historical context, context of minstrelsy um, and the facilitation of what has been called high-tech blackface or yellow face, uh, which allows players to adopt marginalized identities as imagined from a white point of view. According to the game scholar uh, Kishana Gray, who was there last uh, time in this talk series, um, su such appropriations of racial identities can be understood as a form of cyber typing, kind of closely related to cyber typing, which is a term coined by the internet scholar Lisa Nakamura in her study Cyber Types from 2002. Um, this so term cyber type typing invokes associations to stereotyping and uh, fabrication while also considering the fluidity of cyberspace as a new condition for identity performances so we can go through virtual spaces and become the person. According to, to Lisa Nakamura, um, digital space has reformatted racism in that sense through computer human interfaces and their dynamics and the economics of access, right? Uh, for example, many games like The Sims that we see here allow players to access the world through customized avatars which is a form of a way of remediating stereotypical assumptions about minorities. Uh, Nakamura has discussed this using the concept of identity tourism as well to describe appropriations of racial identities in virtual spaces. Um, she writes that um, tourism is a particularly apt metaphor for describing the activity of, of racial identity appropriation in cyberspace, because it captures the aspects of movement, recreation, exoticism, kind of relaxing in an exotic space that's often associated with digital spaces, including games. So this notion of identity tourism encapsulates the promise of digital culture that at least temporarily we can let go of our uncomfortable real world identities and take on a different role, role step into the shoes of someone else. Um, it's kind of in Nakamura's work, players take a vacation from fixed identities and locales and perform this vacation as a pleasurable recreational crossing of cultural boundaries. Um, besides question, question of visual representation and identity making, game scholars have also talked about how imperialist agendas of whiteness are perpetuated through prescribed rules and mechanics. Um, so colonial hierarchies persist in game spaces which position the assumed white player in the role of the explorer, the conqueror, the civilizer in charge of an undefined, unowned territory that's just ready to be taken, right? Like Lara Croft here, we see is on the way to raid a tomb in the background. She, she, she expresses this entitlement to traverse that space, take from that space, use invasive tools and weapons in order to gain dominance over the space. Um, the game studies uh, scholar um, Suvik Mukherjee has also stressed the importance of maps as key facilitators in any empire building game. Here, um, the gameplay often revolves around the removal of the, of the fog of war, like here in, in Warcraft 2. Um, the remapping of, of the game space, the construction of buildings and so on is at the center of these gameplay mechanics. And these conventions basically reenact the colonizing, the civilizing mission take uh, by taking ownership of cartography, 
In the field of analog game studies, uh, prior critical work has engaged with questions around how abstract game rules in tabletop gaming often both simplify and glorify colonial histories. Um, like for uh, more particularly researchers have uh, critiqued the combination of partial histories, like a theme, for instance, and economy based mechanics, um, especially in colonial theme board games, which produce um, colonial fantasy, which is sold to family audiences. But this will be relevant for later as well. Um, keeping Keeping in mind this bigger picture of gaming as part of a global capitalist colonial complex, uh, white imperialist features pervade practically all ludic entertainment products, um, including those most enthusiastically praised by educators, fans, and critics. For instance, think of Minecraft, where you also explore an open space um, and make it yours. So overall, these studies have done really important work in contextualizing gaming as what, what, um, uh, what, what has been mentioned as a racial pedagogical zones of whiteness, in that they encourage players to internalize and enact these particular values that have been grown during colonial times. Um, and my readings of, of the two games that follows um, is, uh, heavily impacted by these previous discussions um, and the way I attempt to acknowledge to make strange uh, performances of whiteness. Um, so most importantly, keep in mind these three terms of colonial fantasy, identity tourism and cyber typing as we move forward. So the star of Africa. Um, so the Star of Africa is a board game, which has been made by the Finnish Kari Manerla in 1951. And just as a context here, um, uh, Manerla has also uh, reported that he has been very much inspired by the popular culture of that era, uh, Tarzan and the Jungle Queen, which came out in the, I think in, in the uh, 40, in the, early 50s and, and, um, and late 40s. Then there's this German film, Der Stern von Afrika, which directed by Alfred Weidenmann, that's set in the 40s. Weidenmann has made his career um, during the Nazi era. So there's a connection here. Um, and what these kind of products have in common and what has inspired Kari Manela here is um, all of these media products um, center white people experiencing something adventurous somewhere in an unspecified unspe exotic location, or sometimes it is rather openly specified. Um, there is this Orientalist power fantasy that white people, um, the most important um, actors in a geography that is serving as an exotic backdrop. Um, so the focus uh, in the interaction is between is on the white people among themselves, their individualist growth, their adventures, their bravery, <clears throat> their, <clears throat> excuse me, the ability to turn the barbaric into a civilized space via their presence. Um, and non-white bodies in these films and media are often absent or stereotyped. In other words, there are pleasures at stake here for white audiences. The pleasure of seeing one's race as a heroic as important, sophisticated as refined. We are confirmed in our self image as benevolent discoverers, globe trotters, and brave adventurers. Um, the game Star of Africa, uh, the board game, draws on this effective pleasure, pleasure by taking, taking it to the level of playful rituals. So, to understand how these playful rituals are facilitated, I look at three design features. The way this game makes maps and the gameplay and um, the question of bodies and role taking. So first, map making and cartography have more generally been described as powerful tools in imperial control as already mentioned and 
as a key component in the colonial construction of gaming spaces. So European colonial maps of Africa have historically served not only to neutrally sketch discovered territories, but to declare some kind of symbolic ownership over these territories from a Eurocentric perspective. So in his satirical poem here, which you see on the right side of the slide, um, which is called On Poetry a Rhapsody by Jonathan Swift from 1733, he calls out this convention when he writes, um, uh, so geographers in African maps with savage peoples fill their gaps and or unhabitable downs place elephants for want of towns. So the image of the savage is kind of directly translated to cartographic failure or embarrassment, gaps in knowledge, right? So the need to cover up these gaps of poor European understanding by drawing relatively uh, pretty elephants um, and horrendous savages, it kind of indicates this white imperial insecurity and the embarrassment over its own ignorance. So we cannot fill the gaps so we cover them up with wild creatures. Much of this is continued in the design of the South African Africa game board, which adopts the visual language of colonial style cartography, which represents um, Africa in a way that's palatable to white European players. Because we know these conventions, we don't trouble them. Um, when it comes to the presentation uh, of African geography, the map highlights uh, 32 places. These are the red dots. Um, they are kind of equally represented by through these red dots um, and referred to as cities in the rules. Uh, upon closer inspection, however, we see that these cities, in fact, include references to nations, regions, and landmarks as well. So one can, for instance, travel from Cairo to Egypt. You can see that on the right upper, upper uh, side. Um, and we can, we can also go to the so-called slave and gold coasts, which refers to, which uses outdated historical names for the Lagos and Benin region. Um, so this conflation of different partly offensive geographical categories and names from different points in time under a single visual category, the red dots, signifies how little geographical accuracy matters to the game. Um, there are two locations which visually stand out um, and hold a special function of start and end points. These are the ones, the regions that are circled, or the, in this case, the cities. Um, Tangier and Cairo. And this, it is significant that these cities are located in the north and thereby define the direction of ludic expansions and looting southwards. This direction attributes positive experiences with the north. There's home, safety, success, winning, um, while classifying in-game, inland expedition towards the south as risky and dangerous. And on the visual level, Tangier and Cairo are represented by uh, com comparatively large illustrations of the Grand Mosque and the Giza necropolis, um, uh, marking them as civilizations as important, as civilized. Um, compared to this civilized north, um, Central and South uh, African regions are cramped with stereotypical images of primitive peoples and wildlife roaming the jungle. So the relegation of African presence to the decorative level represents them as passive and frozen in time. African peoples are, are literally stuck on the game board with, with, which contrasts them to the active mobile white players moving their tokens across the board and taking from the board. This mimics what um, Anne McClintock has called panoptical time which is a colonial viewpoint from which European activity is treated as the pinnacle of human civilization, while indigenous black people and people of color are imagined in a state of perennial pastness. 
Um, this also minimizes the documented history of pre-colonial African politics, the existence of kingdoms, empires, state-led principalities, city-states, and so on in pre-colonial Africa, right? It also erases the reality of structural resistance of Africans to colonial attempts at domination. Um, at the time the game was released in the early 1950s, uh, 177 million Africans lived on the continent, which is absolutely erased by the game. In that sense, the game repeats the logics of the already mentioned 1884 and 85 Berlin Conference, where 13 European states, the United States of America and the Ottoman Empire, decided on how to divide up Africa among themselves, quote unquote, in accordance with international law. Africans were not invited to the meeting. And the Berlin Conference is commonly held at, as the starting point of what is now known as the scramble for Africa or new imperialism, a period of heightened colonial activity by the European powers. And um, the petition, the petition of the African continent, with the exception of uh, Liberia and Ethiop Ethiopia, was done without any consideration for the his history of the society. It cut trade routes. It was literally an act of putting a ruler uh, on a poorly drawn map and dividing um, the continent. In other words, the conference and its aftermath did irreparable dam damage to the continent. As Arthur Arugama says in 2004, um, this conference and its aftermath helped to legitimize the negative attitude towards Africans and to confirm a dented image of the continent as, and its people. The institutional dimension as exemplified in the degrading exhibitions of exotic peoples, the stance of European churches, the role of scholars, writers, painters, artists, and the elite group in influencing and shaping public opinion, images and perceptions continues to make enduring impressions on the thinking of many Europeans about Africans and Africa. And we can put board games and games on that list. But how actually are players invited to enter, explore and exploit this map? This starts with the tedious ritual of setting up the game by putting the 32 city markers face down on the African map and by receiving 300 pounds from an undefined nebulous bank. So the players then put their pawns on, on either of the two starting cities, Tenshi and Cairo, and then they roll their dice and make their way through into the continent using their finances to cover air and boat travel and to flip, literally flip the tokens in the hopes of finding the um, titular diamond um, somewhere hidden under it, one of these tokens. And this can be a long process since tokens can contain a variety of, of items, including gems which, gems which can be exchanged for money, some white bandits that look a bit like cowboys um, who would take all the money, or there can also be nothing at all under it. I heard that in a Finnish group of players that this is called milk. Some, some house rules are applied here to kind of make the game ours as players. So once a player has found this diamond, the objective now is to run from the continent and to make it into safety at one of the starting points. So, the game does not really challenge players to ask whether to exploit Africa, but only how to do so, um, and to do so most efficiently in the light that there is competition, namely European competition around the board game table. When the players receive money from an undisclosed source, without explanation, without any justification, they are neither supposed to, to question the purpose or origin of that money, nor are they to second guess um, the, their own rule given entitlement to take that money and invade that space. This is just simply treated as a given. Um, so much in line with nationalist agendas during new imperialism, 
the game stresses the importance of inter-imperial fights, right? So how can players plan their budgets most carefully, more carefully than their opponents? Who gets to find the diamond? Can the finder be stopped? And this fixation on game economics centers the affect, the emotion of greed, right? A core mechanic, um, which is also at the core of white um, expansionist power fantasies. From the moment the game starts, players are encouraged to treat Africa as an exploitable surface, an exotic backdrop to the real game, the competition with other white people around the Nordic summer cottage table, often a parent, a beloved grandparent, a dear childhood friend, a grandma, a significant other. So speaking of family members, this recurrent attitude of Star of Africa as a children's game, um, that is something that comes often up in reviews of that game. And it's, an, it's indicative of a widely held belief that games are pure mechanics machines um, rather than politically charged artifacts with a history and a context. So many reviewers on Board Game Geek, for instance, acknowledge the pedagogical function of the game um, by teaching kids how to count or how to roll a dice. Um, but they seem to disregard what their white children might learn about colonization, the relationship of Europeans with the African continent, or um, whiteness as a historically grown position of entitlement with violent consequences worldwide. So, for instance, um, here are some reviews from Board Game Geek. Um, I quite liked this game as a child, particularly as you could add your own treasures and hazards to it. Wouldn't play with adults, but could go for around with to entertain kids, right? A funny party game or a nice game with children. Excellent choice when in a brainless mood. So, um, these are kind of among the reviews that are the most common. While a small, a small number of reviewers acknowledge that the Star of Africa might actually be better suited as a discussion starter about colonialism than an actual game, um, many more, um, especially users from Finland, uh, char characterize the game solely in its role as, as a national classic whose iconic status keeps us playing it as a proud family tradition with small children, especially because the mechanics are so simple, right? Um, and so this, this discourse of tradition um, uh, is, is very much in line with what the Finnish um, cultural scholar Anna Rastos uh, has called um, selective amnesia of uh, the Finnish exceptionalism. Finland was never uh, officially part of the new imperialism um, and, and established colonies of its own. So it must be presumed innocent and therefore spared uncomfortable conversations around pervasive coloniality, right? Um, so um, the problem is that under the condition of structural racism, which exists all across Europe, irrespective of who was officially a colony uh, or a colonizing nation, the selective forgetting of historical context, coupled with a selective remembering of fond childhood memories, can be seen as its own form of white violence. So this takes me to the question of racial identity. So how the representation of bodies, both in the game and through players participating in the game, confirms um, whiteness. So. Um, Again, critical whiteness studies has argued that all spaces are, uh, are, are racialized and that due to the dominance of white ideology in most spaces in the West, uh, white spaces mostly remain unseen <clears throat> by white people. In the game, the players are represented by pawns of different colors, right? Which um, rather than race represents the players wish to see themselves. We wish to see ourselves as race, raceless, as neutral, as just moving as equals on a neutral game board. At the same time, the game 
uh, the game premise, a uh, premise, the very premise of the game troubles this neutrality by framing players as present in Africa in terms of a well-known story of the glorified explorer of the scramble of Africa, whose racial identity is, is relatively well known to us. We know who did the scramble of Africa, scramble for Africa. So this puts the pawn in a paradoxical position and it illustrates the dynamics of whiteness. Players are expected to play as white superior colonizers while simultaneously are having to deny the reality of race. So going back to the idea that games are racial pedagogical zones, there is a social lesson in this ritual that all players can learn, which is especially children learn how to occupy whiteness correctly, embracing it as a silent category, as a neutral point of view without a history, but treating the game just as a game and nothing else. So in conclusion, rather than through malicious wrongdoing doing or evil, that particular game lets players become white perpetrators through design elements which are perceived as innocent or charming by a majority of European players. Cartography, mechanics, character design, especially the uh, map is often mentioned as quote unquote charming um, old um, graphics. On the level of map making, the game latches on to uh, European um, Eurocentric conventions of geography which continue a tradition of, of symbolic violence towards African societies, peoples, and topographies. On a mechanical level, the coin flipping mechanic um, abstracts the historical atrocities by representing what we do on the African um, continent, looting, um, as a luck-based mechanic, which is an um, economic of progress for the European colonizers. It erases histories, histories of local resistance. It puts the focus on commercial domination, on the competition among the players. It's basically reenacting a white supremacist logic of us versus them, players versus savage, active versus passive. Um, and this is implied in the performance, but never really admitted. Um, so this implicitly bolsters the player's self image as non racialized and therefore implicitly white. Um, and as individuals and links the status of the game as a Finnish family classic directly to white nationalism. So importantly, this is a link which is never explicitly made by players in any of the reviews. Um, while some users say that um, the game can teach colonial history to their children, uh, most comments highlight the Finnishness and cultness and classicness of the game as positives. Some um, uh, well, this is somehow also substantiated by the fact that um, the, the game itself is included in an educational institution, for instance, the Finnish Museum of Games, where the game is being exhibited and sold as an artifact of national importance, kind of like confirming the importance it has for individual players. Um, so playful attachments then uh, to this particular game are framed as a matter of national interest, as something worth preserving. Uh, and those who preserve it, who collect the game, who play the game, can also feel cultured. So um, the Star of Africa demonstrates how uh, historical board games have contributed to the widening of board game spaces through a combination of offensive colonial games elements and the collective sanctioning through a language of nationalist nostalgia and family values. Um, and while gamer audiences have become more diverse since the game was released in the 50s, this fashioning of the Star of Africa as a part of national self-identity indicates the ongoing denial of colonial cruelties. Um, this is ironic given that practice of, of environmental exploitation uh, are currently happening on Sami indigenous land in northern Finland. So the media activist group Suhopan Terror um, illustrates this in their parody of the Star of Africa map by showing that mining areas 
um, in sub meter northern Sami territory, um, mining areas are co in conflict with the reindeer herding areas. So mining legislation is made in the south with little con uh, consideration for the slow recovery speed of the Arctic ground in the north. Uh, ironically, this means that a small scramble for scramble for SUBMI is actually taking place through international mining companies depleting indigenous land and then leaving. Let's move on to the next example because time is running. Um, Ascension, a deck building game released as an analog and a digital game. I chose this game for three reasons. The first, unlike the South Africa, this is relatively unknown. But it's, it's yet another deck building game among many others, and therefore maybe an emblematic example. So if we look at this game, we might learn about the genre of deck building a bit more generally and what it does in, in order to, um, in its attachments to whiteness. So secondly, um, this game is a direct digital adaptation of the original tabletop version, which gives uh, me a chance to observe how racist rituals travel between media and from board game conventions to electronic media and back. Thirdly, and most importantly, um, as a deck building game, Ascension is heavily focused on mechanics, strategies, quantifiable results, and therefore supposedly about logics rather than issues of representation and race. So the core game is about um, building a deck through strategic pur purchases of cards, culling and circulating of a deck. And there's a, a common idea that such interactive rituals are in themselves unpolitical. You're just purchasing some cars, right? You're just thinking of what is the best logical move. Um, and the idea is that only story elements then infuse these rituals with meaning, but the rituals themselves are meaningless. So um, it's con this means that it's conveniently, conveniently optional for players um, whether we want to see mechanics as proliferating racist, sexist, or xenophobic ideas. But um, I suggest that in order to understand the logics of gameplay rituals um, and to make um, strategically favorable choices, the player must be able to identify and perform racist stereotypes that are baked into the game. So how is this done? Um, uh, I'll start by looking at the core uh, gameplay loop. So the base game is played as a race for the most victory points in this pool, which can be achieved through a combination of three techniques, optimizing one's deck, slaying monsters by using battle points, and collecting an appropriate amount of high value cards containing the most victory points. Most cards are affiliated with one of four factions, which are named Lifebound, Mechana, Void, and Enlightened. And as this naming already suggests, these factions create a link between gameplay and the fantasy um, and characterize the game world and its inhabitants. So the, the Dawn of Champion expansion introducing, introduces heroic characters, which are very important, the champions, each of which personifies the characteristics of one faction. This means that rather than being presented with an abstract general vibe, Dawn of Champions directly connects um, these mechanics to faces and bodies with racial properties. There is Data, the master of science, which is the enlightened um, champion. Then uh, he's represented as an old Asian man. Then we have Nairi, the wild queen, the lifebound um, champion, who is a white young woman. We have Kor, uh, the iron mind, um, the McKenna character who is a white passing middle-aged man. And then finally we have Sadranis, the dark servant, a void, um, void faction, who is a black middle-aged man. Um, so in the beginning of each uh, uh, of the games, each player is assigned one of these champions at random. For the du duration of the game, this means that our assigned champion wins a reputation point whenever a card in the faction of our champion is acquired. So bit by bit, this strengthens the power of our champion, the champion assigned at birth, so to speak, and subsequently adds a hero card of, of one's champion to the deck. This means that the, um, that the game encourages players to see the game world through the eyes of our champion and through their race. 
Um, and so depending on, on how well we as a player understand the mechanics of our particular character, we are more likely to gain a strategic advantage over our opponent, and that increases our chances at winning. So because there, we're out of time, I'll look at two of these four characters, Nairi and Sedranis. So Nairi, who, who's the lifebound champion, is represented as a, as a young white woman in a forest environment. The flavor text of the champion card uh, frames her as a teacher of druids. That is an associ uh, association which is visually reinforced by the nature-themed lifebound cards that are in her faction. Um, and her hero card materializes after we gain three reputation points. And when we play the hero card of Nairi, it produces one honor point and it draws one card. And this effect doubles if Nairi is played in the same round as another lifebound character. So this function is called Unite, which is a function that only exists for lifebound cards. And it class classifies Nairi's relationships, um, Nairi's leadership style in ways that are different from the other male champions. So first, Nairi does not directly provide resources. <laughs> um, she doesn't produce runes or power points. Uh, which allows players to acquire or defeat cards. Rather, she produces passive honor by just appearing. So she repeats this patriarchal formula that women should be looked at rather than act, and that's already a value in itself. And secondly, Nairus, and Nairus um, heroic passivity, so to speak, is emphasized by the ritual of drawing a card, which feels like inviting someone else to act on her behalf or to help her. So since we do not know which card will be drawn, Nairi is not able to decide who to ask. Um, so um, we hope, though, that it will be a representative of her own faction, because this means that Nairi would yield double of her impact. So this characterizes Nairi as a champion who relies on a segregated group of people, powerful friends and allies, who um, she relies on them, but once they help her, she's unstoppable. So we might say this is a bit of a Karen mechanic here. So calling the forest police when something's wrong. And uh, yeah, so when it comes to the visual narrative features of the Nairi card, the, you can see that this wild queen defines Nairi already, already in terms of some kind of imperial leader, some queen, right? Um, so there's markers of conventionally attractive white femininity, most notably the long straight platinum hair which spreads across the forest floor. And this can be understood in a double sense of rooting Nairi to the forest while also simultaneously defining her as above it, dominating it, so to speak, almost suffocating the forest a little bit. So the scene is framed by a flavor text in the bottom which claims that Nairi sees all, loves all, and is all, right? So especially this last phrase that Nairi is supposedly, she is all, positions her simultaneously as superior to and as representative of the wilderness to be colonized by her impact, right? Um, so this trope is derived from white women in colonial propaganda history. So for instance, in British imperial propaganda illustrations from the 19th and century, uh, 20th century, the white female body is used to personify white uh, colonies in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and South Africa. And these uh, women are often dressed in Greek togas and adorned with la laurel crowns, um, which invokes this Britain's Greco-Roman heritage. Um, and these uh, white women are framed as, as the imperial civilizing missions and providing stability, moral superiority, uh, procreation. So Nairi too is, is staged in this perfect unsoiled um, white dress, which distinguishes her from her feral surroundings uh, while she's performing a kind of like maternal gesture of care towards the wildlife. Um, so, on the other hand, this, um, this, this notion of purity that's often 
um, evoked through the colonial propaganda, is a bit more troubled with Nairi because um, her maternal mission to rule the forest is not to pre prevent um, prevent or to, to kind of establish purity, but to establish a diverse community across races and species inside the life bound community. So um, what we, we can see a problem with this diversity project in that Nairi's queen status defines white femininity as the ruling power. Um, and so we can see the parallel in the dynamics um, of the of diversity labor in real world institutions where diversity management um, is, is often a way of introducing a white woman to the team. Um, and it also it becomes a way of managing or containing conflict or dissent by just embracing a harmonious empty pluralism of all kinds of colors who live in harmony. Um, and this is kind of repeated here in this frictionless environment of the life bound faction. The second character, Citranis, is represented as a black man, as already said, with tentacle arms protruding from under a purple ceremonial robe. Um, he's holding a large spell book. Um, and so, yeah, Citranis' special hero power is to draw two cards discard one and immediately allow the player to remove a discarded card from the game. So that means um, uh, he banishes cards. So banishing weak cards from the deck is usually desirable since it speeds up the rotation of the deck and uh, makes it slim. Um, like Nairi, who depends on others to perform her unite function, Sedranis depends kind of on weak cards to exist in the deck for him to have a point, right? So while that means that while N Nairi actually can expand her power by growing an empire of life-bound friends, the more Sadranis uses his superpower, the more irrelevant he becomes. Um, on the symbolic level, this classifies um, Sadranis' power as fundamentally self-destructive. Um, and on the visual narrative level, this theme of destruction is directly tied to blackness and marked as deviant. So first, void cards uh, portray usually brown bodies in conjunction with themes of aggression and death. So there's cards like Maniacal Crusher, Guide of Lost Souls, and so on. Um, Sedrani's nickname, the Dark Seventh, um, also um, uses race as a kind of double feature. Um, his status as a servant, as a knowledgeable person, is kind of modified, it's compromised through its darkness, and it suggests a certain untrustworthiness. So Tzadranis is less than human, um, and this is repeated in the depiction of Tzadranis' body, which is only half human, right? The rest consists of um, cephalopod limbs, and, and not only does the, this producing flesh of these tentacles define him as literally half human, they also hold, these tentacles hold the spell book, which is the key to his powers. Um, so this intimate entanglement of alien tentacle horror and racial otherness is a common racist fantasy trope, which is adapted from the famous H.P. H.P. Lovecraft's um, story, The Call of Cthulhu from 26. And unlike the other champions, uh, Sedrani's black masculine body and the intellect does not belong to this world like Cthulhu. And this world um, can be understood in broad terms to refer to the gaming community as a white space more generally, especially the space uh, of online gaming where um, ascension is potentially played. Um, there's still a very white space in which the presence of black gamers is often constructed as deviant through racist profiling or structural racism, as Kishana Gray has to have discussed this in, in her work. Um, so while the perpetuation of, of Lovecraft's white supremacist logic is perhaps not intended by the designers, it still generates a powerful fantasy that allows white racist gamer fantasies to have a space. So, um, whether the players and even the designers of this game see it, um, the racial cyber types, which are constructed through the deck building mechanics, are a tangible result of just survival strategies and doing the best 
possible moves, which are built into each champion's abilities. So even when perceived as mere background illustrations or flavor uh, to the seemingly more important mechanical core, the, the character portraits still have a functionality, a usability function in guiding what we're supposed to do and what are beneficial investments in cards and so on. So white femininity, for example, guides investment in passive defensive honor point strategies, while black masculinity promotes a more power and destruction oriented approach. So for these dynamics to function as racial pedagogical zones, no conscious process of identification is absolutely needed. We don't need to see the race in order to learn about it. It is enough for the players to quickly recognize common stereotypes, translate them into plausible gameplay rituals, and become identity tourists. So deck building cyber types, uh, going back to Nakamura, then emerge from the strategy led investment in cards, which fulfill a so kind of manifest destiny of racial identity, which is not cut off from the rest of the world, but which is rooted and perpetuating white supremacist fantasies. So what do we do now that we have <laughs> looked at all of this? Um, I have some conclusive thoughts and they're very brief. Um, so I will just briefly lay them out and then we can go to discussion. Um, so I'm remembering uh, what Sarah Ahmed cautioned us against in this non-constructiveness uh, of whiteness. Um, what can we actually learn? What can we take away from these types of engagement with whiteness um, in games? Uh, it's kind of an open question that I don't have a lot of concrete answers to. Um, however, I would like to highlight some pointers that have been provided helpfully by the game scholar Soraya Murray. And Murray has asked a similar question in relation to post-colonial game studies. So what is the point of analyzing all this stuff and to kind of engage in the emotional labor of making games, uh, making whiteness strange, making racial identity seen? Um, and her preliminary answer, going back to Gayatri Spivak, is through the notion of affirmative sabotage. So what is affirmative sabotage? It's, as far as I've understood, it's a holistic act of rethinking, for instance, industry standards and ways of being with the goal of a broad, broader political intervention. So this entails what Murray describes as planetary thinking, the feeding the imagination from, um, like moving the imagination away from constantly creating binaries in the form of base, master slave, oppressor, oppressed, user and used and so on relationships. But planetary thinking, according to Spiebe Spiebeck, emphasizes frameworks of empathy, caretaking and responsibility as a right rather than an obligation. So we kind of must struggle to dis discipline our minds away from global domination, from expansion and think instead of the fragility of our relations to planet. I suggest that Mari's plea for affirmative sabotage can be constructively applied to game design practice and the challenge of anti-racist tech development more generally. So it emphasizes that resisting ingrained cyber types, colonial play and identity tourism is possible through a holistic reorientation of the medium ourselves, our playfulness towards planetary engagement. So this kind of planetary engagement is actually already happening, especially in indigenous game development communities where the focus is on community affirming creative practices. This is really beyond the scope of whiteness here. So indigenous games creator and, and researcher Elizabeth Lapensi, for example, has emphasized the potential of uh, critical board game design to model alternative pedagogical zones that use culturally responsive gameplay, um, which is drawn from, from um, uh, uplifting the cultures that are involved instead of proliferating mechanics of, <clears throat> of symbolic colonial violence. Um, 
So for instance, uh, she's discussed this in, in the context of this game, The Gift of Food. Um, in a Sami indigenous context, uh, our old delight has uh, applied indigenous methodologies in the context of game jamming as well, and game design research. It's what she calls combining old ways of living with kind of new ways of creating. So such examples show opportunities for, 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 for affirmative sabotage. They exist, but they very clearly exceed the scope of what critical whiteness studies can do. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm open for questions and discussions. Oh, Yay. and you can reach me under these, um, with these emails or Twitter address. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop recording and then we can go into questions.